in Japanese thinking, in Shinto thinking, a straight line is a good line. When I say a good line, I, I mean it in a moral sense. Hey there, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. This is episode 490 with today's guest, Dr. Sanku Lewis. Who am I? I'm Jeremy Lesniak, Whistlekick founder and host for this show, and everything we're doing at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you're interested in what we're doing to that end, visit whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's the place to find our store and everything else we're doing. And the code PODCAST15 is going to get you 15% off every single thing we have there. Now, our podcast has a website all its own, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We release two brand new shows every week, and our goal here at Whistlekick and with this show is to connect and educate and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to show your appreciation for what we do, you can do a number of things. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media, or at Whistlekick, everywhere you could think of. You could tell a friend. You could pick up one of our books on Amazon. You could leave a review. Or you could support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. Patreon's a place where we post exclusive content. And if you contribute as little as $5 a month, you'll get access. Now, here we are knocking on episode 500. And you might think that you've heard it all. Sometimes I think I've heard it all. But today, we have something that just completely came out of left field for me. And that's not a bad thing. Dr. Lewis came on to talk about himself and his journey. And I could tell pretty early that this was a very thoughtful, contemplative man. And so when I asked him to talk about philosophy and martial arts, he just went with it. We talked about things specific to his style of Taekwondo. We talked about things that are more broadly applicable in the martial arts. We talked about a lot, and we're already discussing having him back. It was a phenomenal episode, and I hope you enjoy it. Dr. Lewis, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Good day. I'm glad to be on. Well, thanks for coming on, especially as late as it is there. This is one of the challenges of doing an international show. Is we all have to figure out time zones and find times that it's you know, not too late one place and not too early another place. And, and uh, you've been quite yeah, accommodating. Thankfully, I am a night owl. So 11 p.m., which it's now at my end, is relatively early. Yeah. Yeah. And where are you? I live in Seoul, South Korea. And well, let's, let's just call a spade a spade. If people go to, you know, your website, your social media, our website for the show notes or something, and then t- they, they see a picture of you, you might not be what they would expect of someone from, you know, who's come on a martial arts show from South Korea. We would, I think, statistically expect someone who is Korean. But you and I were yes. talking a little bit before, uh, you, were, you were not Korean. And thus, no, I'm I, guessing um, there's a story of how you ended up in Korea. <laughs> yes, quite an interesting story. And it's very much related to the martial arts. So I am South African. And I started doing martial arts as a teenager. Actually, my brother and I really loved Kung Fu movies. So we used to watch, you know, Jet Li, Jackie Chan, those types of movies. And we wanted to do Kung Fu, but in our hometown, we couldn't find any Kung Fu schools or even in the neighboring towns. And then one day we saw a newspaper clip for Taekwondo. We had no idea what it is, Um, but it had this tag, like in the movie, best of the best, which we had seen. So we thought, oh, that looks cool. We liked the movie. Let's go try it out. And that was about 25 years ago. And then I went off to university, studied, eventually got my master's degree. And by that time, I was already maybe a third degree black belt in ITF Taekwondo. And I don't know how familiar the listeners are with ITF Taekwondo, but the forms in ITF have very particular names. Each form is named after 
a Korean historical figure or some Korean philosophical idea and so on. So as you progress through the belts, you get to know a lot about Korea, Korean history, Korean philosophy, Korean um, heroes and so on. So, of course, I became quite enamored with Korea. And when I finished my master's degree, I thought, you know what? I am tired of studying now. I want to earn some money to start with and see what Korea is about. So I came to Korea and worked as an English teacher for one year. I didn't like teaching English, but I did like Korea. But I left. I went back to South Africa with the intention of pursuing a PhD. I was there for one year working as an um, assistant lecturer part-time at the university, trying to get this PhD off the ground. And then I got this job offer at the university in Seoul. And yeah, I took I took the job. I came back to Korea. That was about nearly 12 years ago. So I've been back now for almost 11 and a half years around. Um, and I eventually did do a PhD, but not back in South Africa. I ended up doing it here in Korea. We've had a number of people come on who started training in a martial art and then ended up moving to that country, you know, people who trained in Mm. karate and and moved to Japan or Kung Fu and moved to China and now Taekwondo moving to Korea. When we talk about a martial art that has a historical home, you know, certainly Mm. Taekwondo Mm. has its home in Korea. I would imagine as someone who's never been there, that you get to have an even better understanding of that martial art. You talked about the forms in ITF and, and I train in ITF, so I'm familiar with these forms. And yeah, the, the definitions, as, as at least we call them in uh-huh. high school, teach you a lot about Korean history and philosophy. But I, am, am I correct in assuming that your understanding of Korean, not just history and philosophy, but also Taekwondo expanded just by living there? Well, firstly, you are correct. Um, but I had all kinds of preconceived ideas about um, Asia, so um, East End Asia, about Korea. So, you know, I expected Korean people to be wearing traditional dress because this is the imagery that, um, yeah, I, I just had in my mind from learning about all these historic figures. And if you go to a library and you get a textbook about Korea, um, especially like 30 years ago when I did that, um, you see pictures of people in their traditional dress. And of course, it was nothing like that when I got here. Um, so there were lots of preconceived ideas that I had, which I had to get rid of. And then on the other hand, there's definitely something about learning more about the culture Um that enhances your understanding of the martial art. One thing is the language. Now, I am not fluent in Korean, but I I get by. And knowing the Taekwondo terms in the Korean terms, it actually expands your understanding of the technique because some of the uh, techniques are just badly translated into English. Um, but when you understand the, the original, word for a technique then you know you get a completely different layer of understanding and appreciation which i think people don't get otherwise Hmm. can i put you on the spot and ask for an example so um yes in in itf taekwondo we have this technique called a reverse turning kick now a turning kick is a roundhouse kick and usually it's done with the um, front of the knee, the shin or the instep or the ball of the foot. Uh, In ITF Taekwondo, we especially prefer the ball of the foot. So that's a turning kick. But what is a reverse turning kick? Now, most people think that the reverse turning kick is a spinning heel kick, but that is not the Korean term. 
in the Korean term, the ande, that reverse, which is translated into reverse in English, actually means the opposite of. So ande dolyo chagi, or reverse turning kick, is the opposite of a turning kick. So if you were to kick, let's say, with the instep or the ball of your foot, when you do this roundhouse kick, for a bande dolio chagi, it means you will attack with the back of the foot, the heel. Um, so it doesn't mean a spinning heel kick as most people consider it. It actually means like a, a heel, just a heel kick without the spin. So of course, we often do it with the spin as well, um, but that is not what the Korean term refers to. So oh, that's a- interesting very common mistake. So in the ITF encyclopedia, we have this term reverse. Um, but it's actually, there are three Korean terms used. For instance, we have the knife hand strike and we have a reverse knife hand strike. And in that case, the Korean term is dung sonal. Sonal is knife hand and dung means back. So the back of the knife hand is what the Korean term refers to. So the back of the knife hand, but in English it's translated as a reverse knife hand. Mm. And then we have um, bande dolio chagi, which is the opposite of a dolio chagi, the opposite of a turning kick. So that's another term that's translated into English as reverse. But yeah. Um, it means opposite of, or inverse would probably be a better English word for that. And then there's the, like a reverse punch, a punch that's done with the fist opposite to the leading foot. And that's also another Korean term. Um, so there's some problems with the translation into English of these terms, and we often confuse them. Um, so that's something that you definitely improve on or you, you really learn interesting levels of interpretation, which we completely miss just because of the language barrier. Wow. And how quickly when, when you arrived, because I, I think you said you were a third degree, third Don? Yes. When you went, so if, if you're a third degree black belt in, in any martial art, assuming that language is part of your training, you've got at least you think, a pretty good understanding of these words and what they mean. How quickly did you realize that there were differences? Um, I started realizing that a little bit earlier, before I came to Korea, just before I um, finished my master's degree, I already knew, I had to, already had the intention of coming. So there was this Korean lady at the university I worked at. Her husband studied um, theology there. And so I approached her and asked if she could teach me some Korean because I have this intention of going to Korea. And so when I started learning Korean and I could read Korean, because actually learning the, the Hangul, the Korean alphabet, is relatively easy. So uh, as soon as I started doing that, I started to notice this the discrepancies between the Korean and the English. So it was, yeah, even before I came to Korea that I noticed, oh, the things I thought I knew is quite different. And then coming to Korea and having a Korean instructor um, to talk to, it, it became very clear quite early on that a better understanding of the language will help me a lot to understand the martial arts. Which is interesting, by the way, because Taekwondo is a very, um, it's quite a literal technical martial art in the sense that there are not very symbolic terminology for techniques. There's no pulling the dragon's tail or grasping the peach or anything like that. Our terminology in Taekwondo is quite straightforward. Um, but nevertheless, there's still layers of language that can be lost through translation and bad translation as well. 
Mm. Have you made any, I guess, efforts to help others? Maybe the people from the Dojang that that you came from in South Africa. Have you have you shared this information with them? Um, yeah, I have a blog. I was quite a prolific writer on the blog at some point. Um, I still write posts every so often, but not as often as I used to. But in any case, I have written several posts um, on the blog about this language problem. Um, the blog actually started when I came, or just before I came to Korea, I had my dojang in South Africa, and I wanted to share with my students um, you know, things that we don't get time for in the dojang, and then also my experiences abroad. That's what it started out as, but it very soon became more uh, a blog about taekwondo and Korean martial art technique and philosophy. Um, yeah, so to answer the earlier question, I do try to, to help people with the language thing, and I, uh, I'm part of some... Um, Facebook groups about the study of Taekwondo where I also share my knowledge of the language. Now, I must say I am not a fluent speaker, but as far as Taekwondo goes, my vocabulary is relatively decent. Great. And I think we're starting to hone in on a theme here. You've talked about philosophy and the understanding, the academic side of martial arts. And, you know, I, I've cheated a little bit, of course, you know, I, I know a little bit more about you than the listeners might, might know at this point, but I'm getting the sense that the, the why of things is something that really matters to you and probably drives what and how you train today. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, I, when I started doing not started, but during my training as a ITF Taekwondo practitioner, and you start to compare your movement with other martial arts, let's say with karate, and then why do ITF practitioners move in this peculiar way compared to karate? And Taekwondo is a derivative of karate. It came out of karate, but we move in a very unusual um, way. So at first, it was the circular motions that grabbed my attention. And I was curious about these weird circular motions we have in Taekwondo. For instance, in karate, when you throw a punch, the punch comes directly from the hip to the target, which is maybe solar plexus height. But when we do a punch in the traditional way in ITF Taekwondo, that's not where the punch comes from. The first, you relax, so the fist has moved, not uh, forward from the hip and then we kind of pull it back in this arc all the way maybe to the chest even and from there we propel the punch forward in this interesting circular fashion and I was fascinated with these circular motions and so when I came to Korea the first time I decided you know Hapkido is a martial art full of circular motions I should go do Hapkido and thankfully, at the time, when I started, there was another foreigner who was already a black belt. I can't remember what his rank was at the time, maybe a, probably already a third or fourth gun. And he had also practiced in ITF Taekwondo. And he could teach Hapkiro to me or the principles in Hapkiro to me using the vernacular of ITF Taekwondo, which really helped me to understand the style. And it gave me a sense of what, what's behind some of these circular motions. But I, there was another movement that I couldn't figure out, and this is this bounciness we have in ITF Taekwondo called sine wave motion or knee spring motion. And I decided, you know what, there's another Korean martial art that has a similar bounce, and Taekyeon, and I want to go train in Taekyeon. So I went there and with the sole purpose of trying to understand this bouncy motion. And after training in Taekyeon for some while, I realized that in Korean 
dance, traditional dance, there's a similar type of up and down movement, bending of the knees movement. So I started doing Korean dance and all of it was in an attempt to understand ITF Taekwondo better. Um, and this might go into some of my current research as a martial artist um, and as a martial arts scholar. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk more about my PhD first, which is related to martial arts, or shall we continue talking about this interesting movement theory um, in Taekwondo? Hmm. I'm contemplating how to how to switch gear or or how to how to continue this. Mm. There we go. Sorry, I just lost my window. That's okay. When we talk to people who veer off and and train in other things, they they talk about how you know their first martial art helps them understand their second martial art which you just talked about and how their second martial art helps them understand their first martial art mm. you know could you go could you talk about how your hapkido training impacted your taekwondo yes um the hapkido is interesting in that you know, Hapkido and Taekwondo basically covers the same, or especially ITF Taekwondo, basically covers the same material. So in Hapkido, it's focusing on throwing techniques and joint blocks, but it also has kicks and punches and blocks. And the same with Taekwondo. In Taekwondo, we have the kicking and punching and blocking, but we also have these other techniques, the throws, the joint blocks, some dojang trains actively trains in it others do not but that so hapkido and taekwondo itf taekwondo is very much sister martial arts and they share a lot of commonality but there's a difference in emphasis in hapkido the throwing and joint locks in taekwondo the striking um so training in hapkido helped me to better understand this part of ITF Taekwondo that is sometimes not um, fully practiced. Now, thankfully, when I was really small, I did some judo under my father who used to do judo. Um, so I was already somewhat uh, exposed to break falls, throwing, and some joint locks. Um, but I wouldn't say that I was a martial artist at the time. I just did it because it was a good way to spend some time with my dad. Um, but doing Hapkido helped me to get a sense of uh, a little bit more of a philosophy sense. In ITF Taekwondo, we don't focus much on um, the philosophical. There's sections in Taekwondo which we call moral culture. So these are kind of moral teachings from um, East Asia, but it's not really philosophical in the sense that it's not trying to um, help you understand the movement from any philosophical framework, mm -hmm. which is different in Hapkido. In Hapkido, you do have kind of a, a sense of Amyang. Amyang is the Korean for yin, yin yang. Um, so Hapkido has that sense of Amyang where you, you are in the negative space, receiving space when an attacker comes, and then you would redirect that force and create a young, uh, a positive energy, something like that. So this helped me to understand in ITF Taekwondo, we have the same thing, where there's, there's this moment at the start of a technique where you relax, you drop your body weight, your, your mind becomes focused, and then the movement initiates from the space of stillness. So this was not something I think I grasped as, as intensely before I started doing Hapkido. And then there were some other philosophical um, ideas in Hapkido about 
the circle, um, keeping the flow. And it was through that that I could better understand something like the sine wave movement in Tekono. Um, the sine the sine wave, scientifically speaking, is an derivative of a circle. It's plotting the points on a circle over time. That is what the sine wave is. And in Hapkido, you have all these circular motions. So when I made that connection between, okay, the sine wave is actually just this circle principle um, applied differently, applied over a, a longer space or applied over time, it really helped me to understand Taekwondo better, um, particularly ITF Taekwondo, because we have this there's a sine wave concept mm. in our movements. And I'm wondering if you might unpack that sine wave concept for a moment, because anyone who's trained in ITF uh, at least has seen it. You know, it's pretty core to the way things are done. But it's yes a direct yeah. uh, violation, I guess, of mm. what is taught in many other martial arts. In fact, I'm not aware of of sine wave being taught in that formalized way. You know. You could graph it and sign yes. it. I'm not familiar with any other martial art that teaches movement in that way. And so I'm wondering if some of the listeners who aren't familiar with ITF may be feeling a little lost right now. Yes. So while I explain it might be different from um, other instructors' interpretation of it, um, but I will explain it from my understanding. And my understanding is very much influenced by living in Korea and studying um, Korean philosophy. But let, let's start with a normal um, sitting stance punch or a, a horse riding stance punch. So in a typical um, sitting stance punch, as you would find in karate or even Shaolin Kung Fu, the person would be in a very wide stance, um, their center of gravity lowered, and from that, they would pretty much keep their body, center of body, um, center of mass still, and punch. And the power of the punch would most likely be derived from just uh, turning the hip. In the case of karate, Shaolin Kung Fu sometimes, you know, especially as it's um, practice these days, wushu, um, we just use the arms. Um, so it's very much just a muscul musculature creating the force for the punch. Now, in ITF Taekwondo, when you do that same technique, suddenly we are doing a few phases to the technique. The first most important thing would be start with relaxation. And um, so many people, when they think of the sine wave motion, they have these three phases of relax, rise, and then throw or fall or execute the technique. And it's only really, the technique only starts after you've relaxed. So this is the first part. So you have to relax into or sink into this um, place of focused relaxation and it's important for it to be a focused relaxation it's not just going limp and having no focus it's really it's almost a meditative act in that sense and then from there we would launch the movement so the second part of a typical sine wave movement would be to create potential energy so we do that by lifting the center of mass and from there, we'll go into the third part, which is to convert that potential energy or the body mass into kinetic energy. So we basically throw the weight of the body um, using gravity and using our musculature, like hip rotation or whatever the technique may require, um, forward towards the target. So these are the three phases. So we relax, we rise, and then we throw the technique using our body. And this has a scientific um, reasoning behind it. And it's very simple. It's 
um, mass times acceleration. Um, so we lift our body mass up and then we accelerate our body mass towards the target. Now, if you think of these three things, you actually do find them in many martial arts. Um, you, when you talk to a boxer, they will tell you how they kind of drop their weight into the punch. Um, or if you think of a judo player, first they go and they lower their um, center of gravity under the opponent and then they lift them up, rising, and then they throw them back to the floor. So even though other martial arts don't necessarily formalize these three phases, we do find this idea in several martial arts. I can think of Xing Yi. Um, uh, one of the Chinese internal martial arts, where they actually describe their movement as um, controlled falling. And that's pretty much what we do as well. So when we punch, we kind of fall forward with our whole body weight, but in a very controlled manner and um, hit the target with the, the force of the whole weight of the body, not just the, the arm in isolation. So the sine wave movement is both a technical concept, like a way to create power, um, but it's also a cultural concept, and we can talk a little bit about that uh, momentarily. Um, but I want to say that this is this whole idea of sine wave movement is a very beginner level concept. It's a way for us to teach the beginner a certain principles of movement. And um, we don't have to be stuck to this relax, rise, down um, formula. Some, some techniques require us just to go up. Sometimes we are already in a high position, so we will just drop the weight down. So it really depends on the technique and in a case-by-case -case scenario. But just as a as a teaching aid, we have this idea of a sine wave, and I mean even the term sine wave is a little bit of a misnomer because what we are doing is really a cosine wave, first going down, then up, then down. Um, but in any case, that's the term we inherited, which is interestingly not the term used in the Korean texts. Um, so that's another oh. language barrier. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i I'd, I'd love for you to expand on that if if you're willing you you said that there's sure. more that we can go into i mean i i you're explaining sine wave better than anyone's ever explained it to me so i'm i'm enjoying this yeah so on my blog <laughs> i've written numerous articles essays over the years about this sine wave concept but it's just kind of as i get to understand it better um, so two things, let's quickly talk about the Korean term. Um, in Korean, the, the term used is the back of the bow. So a sine wave is the shape of the wooden part of the bow, so not the string part, the wooden part. So it's basically just a curved thing. And it's clearly meant as a metaphor because it's contrasted with other types of shapes in the ITF Tekono Encyclopedia. One of the shapes is a sawtooth shape, so very jagged motions. And we should not do jagged motions. That's the one big no-no. And the other big no-no is not to keep your body completely um, stationary um, as you move, completely without any up and down movement. So in... ITF Taekwondo, we allow for and we will even encourage a type of um, soft flowing or sine wave kind of movement, a wave in essence. Um, why exactly the founder of, te of ITF Taekwondo decided on the term sine wave for the English translation, I don't know. Um, it may have been to make it sound more scientific for a Western audience. Um, but yes, that's not the term used in the Korean version of the ITF encyclopedia. Now for the other point. 
um, I mentioned that sine wave motion has this technical aspect, but it also has a cultural aspect to it. And this is something I learned when I started doing first Taekyeon, which Taekyeon is a traditional Korean martial art. It's often described as a folk martial art, um, in part because it's done to the folk music, to the traditional music, and it was a game that people would do at uh, folk festivals, at traditional um, Korean festivals during certain festivities like um, the Thanksgiving holiday, um, Chuseok, or the um, Lunar New Year holiday, Solal. So during those holidays, towns would come together and they would sometimes compete against each other, practicing these folk martial arts, Taekyeon being one of them and Shirem, which is a wrestling style being the other. So I started doing Taekyeon because I noticed that they also have this interesting up and down movement. I, of course, don't call it sine wave. They have a different term for it. Um, but I wanted to know why do they do it? What's behind it? Um, so I soon came to realize or very early on when I came to Korea and watching Korean dance, traditional dance, that they do the same thing. So I really wanted to understand this Korean body culture. And so that's kind of what I mean by the sine wave has a cultural aspect. It's a very cultural way of moving. Now, there are many different ways of tackling this um, concept, but let's stay with um, Taekyeon for a moment. So in Taekyeon, when they do their basic stepping, it's called Pumbalpki, and it's a kind of a three-step basic movement. So imagine you are standing on a triangle, so your feet are parallel, shoulder width apart, and your both feet are on the base of a triangle. And then, so there's the in front of you is the pointy bit, the upper point of the triangle, upper angle. So in Taekyeon, you would step with one foot on that um, front point of the triangle and then bring your foot back and then put the other foot on that front point. And this is kind of called Pumbalki, where you step from one point to the other point. Pum Pumbalki is based on, the Pum is a Korean character, which it's these three shapes. Like you have a triangle and on each corner of the triangle, there's a little box. So you have these boxes um, arranged in this triangular shape. So that's where the Pum comes from. And Balki just means kind of stepping with the foot. And they do this interesting stepping on this triangular shape. And each time they shift the weight, the knee bends. And this knee bending in ITF Taekwondo, we call knee spring, the knee spring motion. And this knee spring motion results in a, a sine wave or wave-like stepping. Now, in Taekwondo, they have another term for this um, uh, knee bending, and it's ogumjil. So ogumjil is basically a term that describes the inside of a joint. So ogum is like the back of the knee or the inside of the elbow joint, and jil basically means movement. So ogumjil is moving a joint in that way. So bending the knee as you step. And they do this kind of bouncing motion in a very interestingly instinctive way. And Koreans, when you ask them about this, they would say, oh, it's natural. Now, for us Westerners, it's not natural to be stepping and bouncing in this way. But in, in the Korean mindset, it's, it's a natural movement. And that's also why you find that um, 
in the ITF encyclopedia, it refers to the sine wave movement as a natural motion. Um, for people that are not Korean, it's probably not a natural way of moving. Um, but for them, it's very much a, it's part of their body culture. And in Korean dance, they have the same type of movement, and it's also called ogumjil. There's various other um, terms for it. One of the terms that they use is gushin, and gushin means the um, expanding and contracting of something. So extending the knees and then bending the knees, that is gushin. And in Korean dance, you see gushi not only in the knees, you see it all throughout the body, this play between extending and contracting. And of course, if you start to really analyze the martial arts, that is what martial arts are about. It's this extending and contracting all the time. That's how you do um, techniques. So there's very much this cultural um, element, this cultural DNA that forms part of this whole idea of um, sine wave movement. And I think it was on purpose, on the one hand, by the founder of ITF Tecrono, but it also was a very subconscious thing by the Korean people who trained in karate early on. So when um, Tecrono formed, was like in the late 1940s, early 1950s, and 60s and 70s. That was the time that Taekwondo um, really developed, and it was based on Japanese karate. Now, karate moves completely differently. There's definitely no bounce in the knees as you step from one um, basic technique to another. It, it is considered completely bad technique to go up and down. Your head should be stable throughout your movement. Um, but the Koreans very early on started to spar and bounce as they spar. So it's a very different way of thinking. And I don't think they were doing it with any technical contemplation. At first, it, they did it because they were Korean. It's just the way Koreans move. And then General General Che, Che Hong hee who is the, the first president of I. TF Taekwondo and the principal founder of Taekwondo, um, he had a, a very, he had a political agenda to make Taekwondo less karate and more Korean. So I think for him, it was more a, a conscious decision to move in a way that reflects Korean body culture rather than uh, a Japanese body culture. Mm. Mm. It's interesting stuff, and, and um, you see a little bit of that history in the book A Killing Art from Alex Gillis. I don't know if you've read that book. Yes, yes. And, and um, um, Alex yeah, talks I, about it's, that. Uh, it's definitely one of my favorite books. Um, Mr. Gillis has a, more of the political opinion that General Che um, changed the martial art for political reasons to differentiate what he was doing from what other Koreans were doing that also used this name Taekwondo to, to identify their martial art. Um, and probably that is true, but I definitely think he also changed it particularly to make it more Korean. And, you know, he explicitly says in one of his writings, this is General Choi, he explicitly said that he wanted to make a Korean martial art. And I think his inclusion of this concept of knee spring and the sine wave motion was definitely an act in that direction, um, making the body culture, changing the DNA into a Korean DNA rather than Japanese, because we can still see um, some vestiges of karate or Korean uh, Japanese movement, especially if you look at older types of Taekwondo, um, Taekwondo groups that broke away like in the 70s, that broke away from the main um, 
either ITF, Taekwondo, or WT Taekwondo um, groups, um, if you look at the way they perform their forms, it's it's karate. They are doing karate, maybe doing the the steps of a you know ITF pattern, an ITF form, um, but the way they do it is a Japanese way, not a Korean way. And I can give an example, maybe of yeah, please um, of the aesthetic of this. So already we have this idea of up and down movements, um, and in Korean dance that would be called verticality. Um, this notion of going up and down, and it might have a philosophical um, underpinning. This is kind of my conjecture based on Korean philosophy. Now, in, in Japanese philosophy, if you look at the yin-yang symbol, it's a black and white symbol, and it's specifically without color because they want to convey um, this yin and yang idea in the most broad terms, um, male, female, night, day, um, hard, soft, and so on. But if you look at the Korean version of the same symbol, the tegato, which you can see like on the Korean national, South Korean national flag, it is in colors. It's red and blue. So it's not a white, black and white yin yang symbol, but it's this interesting red and blue um yang. And these colors have very particular symbolic meanings. The red represents heaven or chon, and the blue represents the earth, ji. Now, as an um, ITF practitioner, you already know chon ji is the first pattern we do, and it means um, creation. But now that you understand that it refers to heaven and earth, and you get this idea that in the Korean mindset, the the yin yang, the um, um yang, is a vertical concept. It's an interplay between what is above and what is below, between up and down. And this might be part of, or, or at least this might be one way to interpret this up and down notion, this knee bending notion that we see in um, Korean dance, Korean traditional Korean martial arts. Um, but something else I want to talk about is maybe the rhythm. So I already mentioned that Taekyeon uh, steps on a three-beat rhythm, or they step in this triangular fashion, and which is a three-beat rhythm. Now, this three-beat rhythm is the basic rhythm of traditional Korean music. And in ITF Taekwondo, we have the same sense. Our um, basic stepping happens in a three beat. Relax, rise, and execute the technique. Relax, rise, fall. Um, so that's one cultural aspect. Another interesting thing is a notion of curved lines being beautiful. Um, so in in Korean aesthetics, there's this idea that a natural curve, and they call it natural, I don't know why, but a natural curved line, maybe the natural curved lines of the mountains in the distance, for instance, um, is inherently beautiful, which is quite different from what we see in Japan. Now, Japan, which which has a Shinto Shintoism as their worldview, they have a different aesthetic concept. They conceive of beauty <clears throat> as a straight line. So if you look at the uh, traditional outfit, the, the kimono, Japanese outfit, you will notice that the cuts as these very straight lines, that the sleeves are very linear. The whole cut of the outfit is linear. If you look at the traditional outfit of Koreans, the hanbok, you notice that the sleeves, the bottom of the sleeve, have a curvature to it. The, the dress has a curved line to it and so on. So for Koreans, there's an inherent idea of, um, <clears throat> of, a of a curvature that is beautiful and natural. 
So this brings us back again to the sine wave stepping when the ITF encyclopedia says, oh, the sine wave is a natural movement um, and it's a naturally a wavy or curvy movement. Um, that is very much a Korean cultural concept. Um, the same with karate. People often think, oh, the reason why the karate punch comes from the hip straight to the target is um, purely, purely, what, what's the term? Strategic, because the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But it could very much be a purely aesthetic reason, not a strategic reason. Because in Korean, uh, in Japanese thinking, in Shinto thinking, a straight line is a good line. A straight line, and when I say a good line, I, I mean it in a moral sense. For, for Shintoism, they don't have this concept of sin that the, the West have inherited. For them, um, straight is good in aesthetic terms, and a curved line or crooked line is evil. And so the, the straight movement, the straight punch or uh, blocks with very angular lines in Japanese karate is, it has definitely a strategic advantage, but it's probably more a cultural thing than what most people realize. And we can notice this when we go to Okinawa. So Okinawan karate, Okinawa as an island is less influenced by Shintoism and they also have less a obsession with these straight lines. So if you look at Okinawan karate, something like Gojuru karate, for instance, you notice many more curved or circular movements in their techniques than what you would find on mainland um, Japan. Wow. I... I... This is exactly what I was hoping we would get to when, when we started talking in the beginning of the episode and I could tell that the philosophy meant so much to you. I was hopeful that we would get into some of these nuanced things in, in a comparison of, of the cultural influence on direction of motion. I wouldn't have fathomed at the beginning that we would go here, but I'm so happy that we did. That was, that was really cool. And this is the stuff that you're exploring, the stuff that people would find on your blog? Um, yes, a lot of this, um, especially these movement things, um, my, is on my blog. Um, I've, of course, grown in my understanding. So things that I wrote 10 years ago, I might not agree with anymore. Um, but yeah, a lot of this is on my blog. Um, okay. And uh, if people want to find that blog, where would they go? So it is a blog spot blog, you know, run by Google. So the name is blogspot.com front slash Su Shim Kwan, S-O-O-S-H-I-M-K-W-A-N. Or if they just go to my personal website, there's links to my blog. Uh, my personal website is my name. Sonku Lewis, S A N K O L E W I S dot com. Okay. And we'll certainly link all that stuff from, from the Thank show you. notes page at our website. Want to want to send people over because this has been a fascinating conversation. A couple more things as we start to, to head out. Uh, I always like to turn the clock ahead. If we look forward, if we look into the future, what are you hopeful? for with your training or expecting to see in your training? Do you have goals? You know, look out to the horizon and tell us what you see out there for you. Yeah, so in ITF Taekwondo, I'm now a fifth done. I uh, was eligible to do my sixth done last year, I think. Um, but I was too busy with other things, including lots of research. Um, including martial arts research to get to it. Um, I am a fourth done in Hapkido and I'm probably time-wise eligible to go for fifth done in Hapkido as well. So there's, there's no hurry for me, um, but those are probably things that will happen. 
Um, mostly at the moment, my focus is still exploring this idea of Korean body culture, traditional body culture. Um, so that's where my head is at most of the time. I Every so often I take classes in Korean traditional music or Korean dance. Um, if time allow, I might do this again this sem coming semester. And then, yeah, I'm pretty busy academically. Um, last year, if I remember correctly, I attended five academic conferences all related to Taekwondo or martial arts in, in from a completely academic perspective. So these are not like workshops or seminars. It's more understanding the martial arts academically. And the same for this year. There's probably two that I'm likely to go to, and I'm busy writing some articles on different interesting aspects of the martial arts. Um, a friend and I just um, submitted an article quite recently, maybe a week or two ago. Um, so hopefully it gets published in a journal not too long from now. Um, yeah, so those are my things. I tend to give seminars when opportunity arises. Um, I just came back from South Africa. I spent just over a month there, and I gave a Taekwondo and Apkido seminar there for two days. And maybe I'll do some of that this year at other places as well. Oh, cool. Shoot, I had something and I lost it. Where did it go? Okay, I'll take a sip of water. <laughs> By all means. Oh, there it is. Are there any books planned? You strike me as someone who would write a book. <laughs> you know, I've been asked by several people or encouraged by several people that I should write a book on some of this stuff. So I've started. Um, I have the outlines at least for two books. The one is on the sine wave motion or the wave motion, trying to explore it from a philosophical perspective and a cultural perspective and then a technical perspective. Because when you, you know, when you read these books about uh, martial arts and the, the movement, it's always from a technical how, how to punch and block or throw somebody. Um, but my angle would be trying to understand these movements philosophically and culturally and then come to the technical aspect. What technical advantages does moving in this way have over another way? So that's one thing I am working on. I, I don't have any deadline in mind, but it's some something I'm working on quite slowly. and. Um, yeah, so this this whole idea of Korean body culture, I just recently finished an article for that, and that might be published um, in a book with UNESCO. UNESCO is doing a book on in, um, intangible cultural heritage, and my these ideas of mine, these research of mine, would might fit in a chapter there. We'll see if it, if it fits or not. Um, but in any case, so I kind of have the backdrop now for writing that book. And then something else I've done, I did a feature of a series of essays for a, a Taekwondo magazine in which I spoke about the value of um, step sparring and of patterns and trying to understand how these things work within the ITF Taekwondo pedagogy. Um, so that's possibly another a book in the making. Wow. Good stuff. Cool. Yeah. Well, I, I thank you for coming on. This has been honestly different than I had expected when we first scheduled. <laughs> But I don't mean that in any sense of a negative way. This has been utterly fascinating. And I'm sure even if you're not an ITF practitioner, the, the depth that we, that we went and, and the relating it back to so many things in martial arts, 
I love when we do this yeah, because it's Yeah, indeed, and we didn't even get to my PhD research, which <laughs> was on a completely different topic, we but didn't. also martial arts related. We're going to have to have you back. We'll have yeah. to have you back and, and, and yeah. do part two. But yeah, I, I'd be keen to do that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I ask the guests every time to choose cool. how they send us out, whether that's, you know, some words of wisdom or, you know, closing thoughts, whatever you choose. How do you want to end this episode here? I like this idea of um, Shuheng. Shuheng. It's a, it's a Korean idea, which we also find in, in Japanese culture of doing a discipline. And this discipline teaches you something about life. So doing like a tea ceremony or um, doing calligraphy painting, but you can also do a martial art, a martial art as a discipline. And I think most martial artists, you know, lifelong martial artists already know this intuitively, but it's a good idea to, to know that it is an actual concept that you do this discipline and this discipline teaches you more than just kicking, punching, hitting, throwing, blocking. It teaches you um, about life, about the conflict in life, about finding harmony in life, about this ability to confront a danger, because that's ultimately the thing that martial arts does best compared to all the other things. I mean, we can learn a body expression through dance. We can learn fitness through um, CrossFit. Um, we can learn silencing the mind through meditation. But martial arts is ultimately about a combative encounter. And coming to the combative encounter with this sense of um, stillness, with the sense of this is just another hurdle in my life's journey. I think that's something martial artists um, have a unique grasp on. There's an interesting book called Risk Failure Play about martial, martial arts and dance. And the author says that the martial arts is a microcosm of how to handle conflict interpersonal conflict. And I think that's something we can learn from martial arts, is seeing it not just as a means to do combat, but as a means to understand conflict in life and the hurdles in our own life and overcoming them. Of course, that's the, the philosopher in me coming out again. In the intro, I told you this was a bit of a different episode. And hopefully you agree. Different isn't bad. And in this case, I thought different was amazingly entertaining and informative and really gave me a lot of insight to some of the things that I've been practicing for years. How cool is that? So thank you for coming on, Dr. Lewis. I had a great time and look forward to our next conversation. If you want more, head over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Every episode has a page unto itself with links, photos, a transcript, and sometimes even more. If you're up for supporting us and the work we do, you have a number of options. You can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% off at whistlekick.com or leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, help out with the Patreon, that's patreon.com slash whistlekick. And I hope that if you see somebody out wearing something with whistlekick on it, you'll introduce yourself. This is starting to happen. I mean, hearing people talking about it, and it makes me so happy. You know what else would make me happy? Hearing your guest suggestions. So go ahead, write us. Jeremy at whistlekick.com is my personal email address, and our social media, wherever you could imagine, is at whistlekick. That's all for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>